What's going on everybody? It's your favorite great boy Brennan and welcome to another episode of B Grade Reading Level here on the Greycast. Today I'm going to be talking about one of my new favorite books based on one of my favorite movies of all time, Star Wars Revenge of the Sith. And I'm going to be talking about the now non-canon novelization of it written by Matthew Stover, published by Del Rey, who publishes all the other Star Wars books. And this is very similar, as uh, you know, as I said, this is the novelization of the movie Revenge of the Sith. But as I can imagine, with all the different Star Wars movies to books, there are going to be, you know, some differences, some very minor, some very major. And uh, you know, just for a couple of minutes, I thought we could talk about that. So, just my immediate thoughts. I actually listened to the audiobook of this. Jonathan Davis narrated this. He narrates a lot of the uh, Star Wars audiobooks, and he does a great job. He also did the narration, I know, for Master and Apprentice, but we'll be talking about that book in another video. Uh, so for now, we'll focus on Revenge of the Sith. So the book starts out with, you know, just like the movie The Battle of Coruscant. But what I like was, I guess, as every Star Wars fan's dream is of the four-hour cut of Revenge of the Sith, this definitely goes way more and more into the Battle of Coruscant. It takes a lot longer in the book. We also see a lot of, like, Anakin and Obi-Wan's inner feelings, and I thought what was very interesting is, you know, the Clone War has been going on for so long at this point that Anakin and Obi-Wan, they're not at odds with each other, but it's no longer, like, buddy-buddy, like, you know, best friends, brothers. There's definitely been a major strain on their relationship from all this fighting on system to system all across the galaxy and it just goes on and on on the book does a great job of Anakin having like this dragon inside of him and basically the dragon kind of represents the dark side for him it's like he keeps trying to keep this dragon away away but the dragon keeps coming it's like you know I am you know I am living I am this and that and it just continues throughout the story which is very cool then of course they get in the ship they find Count Dooku now unlike the movie the movie battle between Obi-Wan Anakin and Count Dooku uh, I, you know it was so short uh, in our one of our last videos um, Super Kami Will and I talked about our favorite lightsaber battles and moments and I don't think either of us put this on their list it's not that the Cory choreography isn't bad or anything it's done very well it's it's one of those blink and you miss it fights which is kind of unfortunate but the book does a great job at showing how capable all three of them are especially you know Count Dooku but he totally underestimates the two of them especially Anakin because the two of them together have kind of almost are just like one perfect being Anakin and Obi-Wan but then as the fight goes on as they show in the book a little bit you know, uh, Darth Sidious, a.k.a. Chancellor Palpatine, you know, arranged this whole thing. And the idea was for Count Dooku to lose to Anakin, um, you know, just have some type of mishap, somehow lose. Dooku would get arrested and basically never pay for his crimes against, you know, the Republic. Because the Empire would just take over and at some point the Emperor, again, Darth Sidious, would just... You know, let Count Dooku do whatever. He wouldn't be there, probably, at that point. He probably wouldn't even be, like, the other Sith. And Dooku kind of acknowledges that. He thinks he would just kind of ride off into the sunset and do his own thing. But, of course, it doesn't quite go uh, to plan. Anakin does beat him. But then Palpatine immediately does the famous, do it. And then, you know, has Count Dooku killed. Which is one of the final steps to getting Anakin to the dark side. The book does a fantastic job of what we see in the movie, but really through more scenes and more dialogue. It's just how manipulative Chancellor Palpatine is with Anakin. Like, even when they're on the ship, as soon as Count Dooku is dead, Obi-Wan's unconscious, and Palpatine right away is like, Come on, Anakin. Get General Grievous. You can end the war right now. You would be the hero. You could have whatever you wanted. You know, Anakin almost does it, but then he's like, no, 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 we, I have to get you out of here, I have to get Obi-Wan out of here. Um, then, of course, everything more or less goes the same. 
they uh, they encounter Grievous. Grievous gets away. Uh, you know, they crash on the ship. They crash the ship down on Coruscant. And then uh, another happy landing. Uh, Grievous is also much more vicious in the book than we see in the movie and the animated, the computer animated Clone Wars show. show. This is definitely a lot closer to the cartoon Grievous, where it's just like no, no mercy. Like he kills, he kills some of the Nemoidians on the Invisible Hand just because they're like, you know, General, we can't do that. The ship will explode. Just basically grabs the one Nemoidian's throat and like just squishes it. I was like, you said what? And he looks at the other the other Nemoidian and like, right away, sir. <laughs> um, yeah, he kills a bunch of the, the Nemoidians, actually, which is pretty, pretty badass. And then the book continues on. You know, we find out Padme's pregnant. For, for a while, everything is relatively similar. Although one of my favorite additions was there's a scene with Mace Windu and Yoda. And it's when... Obi-Wan and Anakin come back to Coruscant. They basically fill in, you know, uh, Obi-Wan, what's been going on since Obi-Wan has been away fighting, and the three of them are members of the Council. And they basically tell Obi-Wan that if Chancellor Palpatine hadn't been kidnapped, there was a good chance that either that day or the next day, probably within hours, they would have found Darth Sidious. Because somehow they were able to trace some type of you know, hologram, something, to the basement of the building where Chancellor Palpatine lived, his private quarters. And at that point, they knew it was like this Dark Lord of the Sith, you know, as they say in the movie, the dark side surrounds the Chancellor. But they assume that it's like, you know, one of his close friends or confidants, maybe even, you know, just playing disguise as one of his royal guard. But one of the best things of this book it blew my mind, is when Mace Windu was sitting there, he looks at the other two and he says, at least we know that the Dark Lord of the Sith can't be Chancellor Palpatine, because Chancellor Palpatine already rules the galaxy. And it was just one of those like, oh my god, dude, you had it, you said it, it's him, it's right there. And they, they couldn't see it, they were just, you know, the book does a great job of showing everything we knew from the movies and the you know extended universe and the canon universe of just like the Jedi were so blind and so stupid I'm just trying to think of anything else that's majorly different we find out before Mace and the other three Jedi including Super Kami Will's favorite Kit Fisto um, enter his office to arrest him that Palpatine actually hadn't used that lightsaber in years now this is Again, this is a, not a canon book anymore. This is this was changed in the Clone Wars show because we see Palpatine wielding two lightsabers and, you know, beating the crap out of Darth Maul and Savage. Um, but I like the idea that he hadn't used that lightsaber in so long. The book kind of gives this idea that Palpatine is above, you know, lightsaber combat. That, the you know, he, he and the dark side have come so far over these 1,000 years of secrecy that they don't need it anymore. He was so excited to hold it. He, he was like, you know, my old friend. Um, but for him, it's not, it was never a necessity. He knew they were coming. So he's like, I need, you know, he needed the weapon at that point. He also opens up a hologram that basically acts as security footage of when the Jedi walk in. And he basically plays it up like, please, please, they're attacking me. Help, help. <laughs> Calling for his guards who... I, the Jedi actually like knocked unconscious before they walked in that last room, which we don't see in the movie, but as I read it, I'm like, oh yeah, that makes sense. There would have been guards there, even if it was his private you know, chambers. And it, it, probably the middle of the night, they're not going to just let the Jedi walk in, even if they were coming to say like the war was over. Fight continues, Anakin kills Mace Windu, Order 66 at that point takes place. It's described very briefly in its like, own little chapter of the book when it first takes place. And again, not canon anymore, but I like the idea that, you know, back in the day, the clones always knew about Order 66. We saw that in uh, the old Star Wars Battlefront 2, that as soon as it was issued, it was just like, hey, we're soldiers. Order's in order. You know, kind of like what we see now with good soldiers follow orders, but instead of it being mind control, it's just straight up that they're that well-trained 
that even you know a Jedi that they've been serving for years and can now can consider a close friend, they're like, well, business is business, and just shoot the Jedi dead. And it also shows that a little different from the movie. I think it. I think he does reach out to Cody first, the Emperor, but um, Order sixty six is also blast uh, plastered everywhere throughout the galaxy. Like it's literally like if a clone trooper were off duty, he would see it like on a hologram, like in the bar, you know, in the cantina. It would just say, "Up, oh, you know, the newly formed Empire has, you know, issued all clone troopers to execute Order sixty six. And at that point, the clone trooper would be like, oh, shit, okay, if I see a Jedi, I'm killing him. Or her. What? And then... I'm trying to remember if there was anything else. At that point, Obi-Wan and Yoda go back. Everyone's dead. They change the, uh, the Jedi trap. Oh, and that's also in the book, too. Um, I almost forgot about that. The Jedi trap was mentioned multiple times, and I really like this. The first time it's mentioned is when Obi-Wan is on his way to Utapau to engage General Grievous. The book kind of has like, you know, the perfect Jedi trap is basically this scenario. A Jedi going to an unknown world. He doesn't know where his enemy is. He doesn't know how many, you know, enemies there are. And it's basically, you know, the enemy not only has to spring the trap on the Jedi... But keep him waiting for days, if not weeks. Draw him out, make him starve, so on and so on. And I like that. It kept it showed like okay, like you know, Grievous went there to hide. But Palpatine in the book does say like more than likely Kenobi's coming for you. And Grievous was pissed it wasn't Kenobi and Anakin, but it doesn't make a difference. He's dying in that situation too. And then you know we hear it once or twice, and then later on, once Order sixty six comes in. Then it comes full circle and the book is like, the real perfect Jedi trap is to get every Jedi, or nearly every Jedi, as far away from home as possible, meaning the Jedi Temple. Which is exactly what happened with the war. As the war waged on, Jedi were pushed further and further and further away from Coruscant to the, obviously, to the Outer Rim, basically as far as you could get in the galaxy. And then all it took was Order 66, and, you know, you have one Jedi on a planet with, you know, thousands upon thousands of clones and droids. If 99 times out of 100, if the clones aren't killing him, the droids are killing him or her and vice versa. And it was just perfect. It was just years in the plan, years in the making, and it worked to the Emperor's perfect demise. And then I'd say the last thing that was really cool in the book... Uh, Obi-Wan and Anakin was very short in the book, so that was, you know, kind of a bummer. But the movie does, it's still the longest, um, like, sword fight in movie history, which is pretty cool. But I really enjoyed reading, or I should say listening, to Yoda and the Emperor. Because basically the book really shows, like, hey, like, this is it. In the history of the galaxy, this is by far... The strongest, greatest Jedi versus the strongest, greatest Sith. And, you know, there's this one passage. I'll try and pull it up on screen for you. It said something along the lines of, you know, Master Yoda, 900 years old, the greatest of the Jedi Order, skilled, powerful, wise, loving, caring, was nowhere near a match for this Sith Lord. And it was just like, whoa! The book said straight up, like, Yoda lost the battle the second he he walked in. He had no chance of winning. And that blew my mind. It just talks about, you know, the dark side. You know, the uh, Ruler 2 Sith, like, they weren't going to fall for that same trap. As, you know, um, as you see in, like, uh, Path of Destruction with Darth Bane. It's not going to be thousands of Sith and thousands of Jedi fighting it out to the death. Because the Sith will lose every time. The Sith had to evolve, and they evolved over a thousand years, and the Jedi stayed exactly where they were, and they fell right into the biggest trap of all time. Um, like I said, Anakin, Obi-Wan, very similar. You know, of course, very similar toward the end with Luke and Leia, Qui-Gon and all that. Nothing much difference there, but it was those changes 
throughout the movie that were really, really great to listen to. If you get the chance, I highly recommend reading this book or at least listening to the audiobook if you're an audiobook person because it's a great listen. Uh, the studio did a great job with um, Jonathan Davis. You know, he does different voices. He does a great Obi-Wan voice. His Yoda is... Eh. His Grievous was very cool. I mean, he just did a great job bringing the story to life, as did Matthew Stover, the author. Audiobook did a great job with, you know, music and sound effects, too, but it was never distracting or anything. So, we're going to start something new here for a B-grade reading level. We're going to actually grade... The book, and I'm going to give this book an A. Not an A+, plus, not an A-. minus. Now, if this were just a regular Star Wars book, if this weren't based on a movie, I don't know where I'd put it. Maybe a little, maybe a little lower. But since it's based on one of my favorite Star Wars movies, and it really does add to the story, it gets an A from me. And on that note, I think I'm going to wrap it up. I've been <laughs> talking a lot longer than I intended, but I guess that shows how good the book was. So thanks for stopping by and listening, and I'll catch you on the next one when we talk about another Star Wars book, Master and Apprentice.